Welcome everyone. My name is Philip Ely and on behalf of the Children, Youth and Families at Risk Professional Development and Technical Assistance Center, thank you for joining today's webinar. We are pleased to have with us Dr. Suzanne van der Hugenhoff and Sam Grant as our presenters today. But before we begin, there are a few administrative announcements I would like to make. So first, uh, a recording of today's webinar will be posted on the CIFAR PDTA Center's website at CIFAR.org. During the presentation, we ask that you would uh, that you can feel free to chat in the chat box. But if you have specific questions for our presenters, we ask that you please put those in the in the Q&A using the Q&A feature as depicted on the screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, a pop-up window will open asking you to participate in a short survey. Please click continue and complete our brief online survey to share feedback on today's presentation, as well as suggestions for future webinar topics. And now it is my pleasure to present our, today's, our speakers for today, our very own Suzanne and Samantha Grant. Dr. Suzanne van den Hugenhoff serves as the Evaluation Specialist for the CIFAR PDTA Center. In this role, she works with CIFAR data, supports sustainable community projects with her evaluation efforts, and provides technical assistance. Suzanne has worked in evaluation research for over 10 years and has conducted evaluations for programs funded by grants from the U.S. Department of Education and the National Science Foundation. She has also worked in the Assessment and Evaluation Office at the University of Minnesota Medical School. And joining her today, Samantha Grant, is Samantha Grant. Sam joined the Center for Research and Outreach, or the REACH Lab, in April of 2022. Before that, she served as the Evaluation Director for the University of Minnesota Extension Center for Youth Development. As part of her work, she has designed and implemented evaluations for youth workers and for youth in the Minnesota 4-H program. Sam brings a solid youth worker background to her evaluation as she has led initiatives to reach new and underserved audience throughout uh, the 4-H programs. She wants evaluation to be exciting and focuses on teaching others about how to present data efficient, effectively through uh, visual reports and presentations. So without further ado, Suzanne and Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I'm really excited that Sam joined us last month uh, because besides uh, bringing um, youth development work and uh, evaluation and extension to uh, us, she is she was also the evaluator for um, CIFAR, uh, for Minnesota CIFAR grant. So, um, the exciting part about this presentation is that we will do the, the high level overview, but also um, we will get tips from the field from someone who has actually done cipher evaluation um, in real life. So I'm very excited that Sam is joining us. And I just want to cue you all that you are going to learn some tips because as Suzanne mentioned, I've been uploading data for the Minnesota site for three years and I learned tips putting together this presentation that Suzanne told me that I didn't know were common errors I was making. So um, I think you all are gonna be in for a treat in learning some new information. So thank you for having both of us. We look forward to learning more with you. Awesome. All right, to start off, us off, um, Philip, can you start the first poll? Um, we would like to know how comfortable our audience is with um, the Cypher Common Measures, just to see where we are all at. And Philip, I'm going to rely on you when the majority has uh, chosen their answer to show us the results. So it looks like we can um, ask one of the attendees to co-present with us. One person is very comfortable. That's very exciting. Um, but most of you, it looks like you're a little comfortable and are looking forward to learning more. And that's why we, of course, are having this webinar. Um, a little concerning that there were two people that said common measures with Ardos. 
Um, so if you have questions, definitely use the Q&A feature. To really look at what we're gonna talk about today a lot, where we have some more questions for you. So um, Philip, if you can start the second poll, um, which surveys are part of the common measures? And this is a multiple choice question. So click all of those you think that are part of the common measures. And so you persons who didn't know that what the common measures are, I'm not sure how you're gonna answer this, but you're gonna learn as the webinar unfolds. <laughs> And we're waiting about one or two more people to answer. This is uh, very interesting. So core competencies is not a common measure anymore for CIFAR. Um, when we were in the previous version of the common measures, you are right, core competencies was a part of the common measures. Um, but at this point, common measures is, or core competencies is not required anymore. Um, the other four are, and a couple more, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. You probably know what the questions are. You just don't know what they're called. I know I had to learn them like, oh, this is what you mean when you say resilience. So we don't expect you to know it all. Um, so let's go on to the next poll. What is not an age group for the common measures? Hint, think about what the word CIFAR stands for. <laughs> for those new people, and thank you new people. I, we got a chat that some of you are very new and we are all learning alongside each other. So a 50-50 split, this is very interesting. Um, so preschool is not an age group for our Cypher Common Measures. If you do work with preschool children, um, we ask that you use the child uh, measures um, with the preschoolers. No way, we know that this is a difficult topic. Um, and so uh, we just try grants to do their best, but those, um, programs that do work with adults and provide an intervention for adults, we do ask that you use the uh, measures with adults, and we do have specific measures for uh, the adult group. Well, we recognize that most of you probably are not working with adults. You're Correct. probably working with youth, so I'm going to give you all points for great answers on that one. <laughs> and the last question is, what is the best way to administer the common measures? in Survey Builder, on paper, in Qualtrics. No one said, I don't know. That's really cool. Two people said other, and I would be curious, would you put in the chat what other way you think is best to um, administer the common measures? Um, and then um, we, uh, we will talk a little bit about this. Um, and as those two that said another method, um, if you, um, the rest of you can also type in the chat. Um, if there are any questions that you hope we answer, um, topics we will talk about. Gold star for Kimberly. Best sometimes depends on the context. Sometimes with paper, sometimes it's electronically. We could have, you could have scripted one of our slides that we will be talking about. Yeah, Philip, same thing. It depends on the program. And yes, Suzanne is going to impress you with some research as you decide which is best. There's 
some science behind what you pick as well as your gut instincts. So as people in the field, we're often bringing together what we know with what research is telling us to make an informed decision for a program. So if there are any topics you wanna to make sure we cover, please add them in the chat and keep adding them as we're talking or ask questions as we're talking. We are happy to respond to what's helpful for you because that's the purpose of these webinars is to help to make sure that you are grounded in the work that you're doing. All right, so we're gonna have one final poll up here in a minute. I fully recognize that people on the call today come from a variety of different roles for their CIFAR program. You might be a, a PI, you might be an evaluator, you might be a community partner. Philip, do you have a poll for a role so we can see if you had to pick the best description for your role on your CIFAR project, where would you say your role is most common? Please choose just so we can kind of know examples that we can pull out. I can share as we're waiting for the results to come in that I was on the Minnesota CIFAR project and I know even though I served as the evaluator on the project, it was key for all people on our project to be part of common measures and to be part of the evaluation process. That's not to say we were doing the same things because we didn't want to be duplicating efforts. We all had our specific roles on the project, but the evaluation would not have happened if all of the evaluation roles sat with me as the evaluator. Right, so we do have a lot of evaluators and PIs on this call. I can say on the Minnesota grant, our PI, Jennifer Scusa and Joanne Jenis, Joanna Jenis were so critical in ensuring that evaluation was part of our agendas, that it was built into the staffing that we had on our, in our program, and that it was an expectation for our community sites. They were key players in getting evaluation collected. And then as the evaluator, it was my job to get it out and get data uploaded into our system. I also want to highlight that the people on the program level serve such an important role to ensure that data comes in. Our Minnesota partners that we work with are so great about ensuring that youth are taking the evaluation seriously that they're pausing in their program at the right time to collect data, that they're following up with kids that missed the pre-survey but came the next session and we wanted to get that taken care of. So they play a vital role in ensuring that data gets collected and that the most quality information can come in for the CIFAR team. Awesome. Um, I've seen some questions come into the chat already, so thank you. That's very much appreciated. Um, but we'll, we'll do some high level first. So why do we use the common measures? Um, and um, the, the, the short answer is because evaluation is important. And um, as a, a program, we have come together to decide on which measures to use. And the measures we have are the ones that we chose. Um, we have a few um, process. Um, evaluation measures and a few outcome measures. Um, so um, the process measures you can really use to see how your program is doing. Um, are there any changes you can make to make it even better for your participants? And then these outcome measures are, uh, are your participants changing their behavior? Are they increasing in knowledge, attitude, um, skills, whatever your um, goals for your project are? Um, so that is um, why we do evaluation this may be more what I should say and then why we use the common measures, because we didn't um, just randomly decide to use them. Um, there is some research behind it so from research on youth development, we know that high quality programs do these things they foster supportive relationships. 
they create a safe environment, they provide opportunities to learn and develop skills, and they engage in activities that are directly related to program goals. And so with um, the common measures, we try to measure these things because we know if these, if these things happen, you have a high quality program. Um, so that is why um, we, we use the common measures. So the common measures have three main components. We have life skills and resilience, which are our outcome measures. Then program quality, dosage, and engagement are our process measures. And then finally, the demographics give background information about participants. So both are all three of these data types help to tell a story about who is engaged in the program, what they experience within the program, and why it matters. So all pieces are critical in order to tell a story about your SciFAR program. And I saw a question come in about an option of throwing things out. And so that is, I don't know who told you that, but that is not an option. These measures are all required measures. One thing I can say from a Minnesota staff is you can add on questions. So we have certain outcomes that we are interested in telling the story about in Minnesota. And so we will add certain questions on. We don't share that information back with the, with the CIFAR team there. The REACH lab does not need to know that information, but we use it for our own reporting. So add, don't subtract. Correct. <laughs> Um, so we have um, three target groups, um, children, youth, and adults. Um, and um, it is correct that um, the uh, child and youth uh, program quality and life skill measures do not are not different except for the response options with the smiley faces for the children. Um, the, uh, the, some of the measures are not completed by the participants themselves because we want to try to get us accurate data as possible. So if you are working with children, um, they complete the life skills, program quality and resilience themselves um, with help, we realize that. Um, but then we ask staff to track their demographic data, their participation. Um, we call it also dosage or attendance. It's really um, checking in to see how often your participants join your program um, and engagement. We realize that engagement is kind of gauging how the, your participants are doing, um, whether they are participating in the program, um, but we're hoping it is a little bit more reliable than having children complete it themselves. Um, for youth, we only ask staff to complete the participants or to track the, the um, dosage, just so the attendance. They do the rest of the measures themselves and adults complete all the measures themselves. Um, Participation, attendance, uh, and engagement, and program quality are only done at post, and the other measures are also done at pre. Suzanne, is that a good spot to talk about reading level or not the right place? <laughs> Just because there's a question in the chat about what reading level are these instruments written at? Yes, yep. Um, so we, know that there are groups that struggle with these measures and we are asking for grantees to send us data so that we can document this. Um, the, we have checked the reading level for the measures and they are the lowest reading levels I think are third grade. Now I know not every third grader reads at a third grade level. So um, that is, um, the, if you measure the statements individually, that is the reading level it comes at. Um, so we are asking for your data so that we can, there, I saw a question about validation. Um, we are asking for your data so we can do specifically that, to validate the data. Not all the measures have to be validated still, but program quality is one of them that we are looking to validate. So here, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the effect of survey mode on uh, your response rates. 
um, or your completion rate. And this is where Kimberly and Philip mentioned, well, it really depends on the context, whether you do it online or in, on paper. And that is true. Um, so the research shows most studies find lower response rate for web surveys um, compared to paper versions. Um, I think this is when you email a link to someone um, and are not physically in the same space with them. Because of course, if you have 20 tablets that you can give your participants and just sit in a room and do it together, you are doing a web version, but in a different administration mode. So that might that will probably change your response rate. Um, but majority of studies find that web versions lower the response rate. Um, there are, of course, exceptions. Um, notably, college age populations, professionals um, are uh, better at responding to online surveys. Um, although there's also a study that I found that showed that people over 50 um, respond well to web surveys, um, although you do have to correct for um, dem some demographic data, um, education and socioeconomic status. Um, so because the research is really all over the place, the, uh, the tip is to know your audience, really know what, what your participations, what your participants can do. Um, there's not a lot of research specifically on children and web surveys, um, although I did find a study that shows that if you gamify your survey, you get a better response rate and children do better with them. Um, so uh, there are some options. Um, and so a tip for uh, the PDE, in two weeks we do have a session on gamification. Um, not necessarily gamification of the surveys, but um, gamification in your program. So even though overall response rates are lower for web-based surveys in general, and the majority of studies show, your data quality is actually higher um, when you use um, web surveys. Um, because when you use an online survey option, the um, non-response rate for items is lower. Um, so participants typically answer more questions when you have it online. Um, we can brainstorm about why that is. Um, of course, when you're on a web survey, you can build in those quality assur assurances, such as uh, a forced response. You can give people reminders when they try to move on without answering questions. Um, the flow is automatically built in. You don't have to go from one paper to the next and accidentally have two stuck together. Um, so um, brainstorming some reasons why that could be. So response rate over a little bit lower, data quality a little bit higher. So I already talked a little bit about, um, you know, that group administration of surveys. Um, there's not a lot of research that really looks at response rates when you do individual versus group administration for surveys. Um, but we do know about cognitive and language development in children that uh, especially children aged four to eight, they cannot read yet. So they cannot do the surveys by themselves. Um, it would have to be a staff member with one or a small group of children reading the questions to them. Um, this is also still recommended actually for ages eight to 11. Um, so they will do it on their own paper or tablet or Chromebook, um, but there will be a staff member in the room um, reading the statements and questions out loud. Um, there is of course, or maybe also the added benefit of peer pressure, everyone is doing it. So, you know, if you're sitting in a room with 20 participants completing a survey, you might as well do it as well. Um, so that uh, is there as well. I'm gonna pause for a second there because I, I see the chat number go up, so I want to make sure that before we jump to the next topic, kind of, we have answered some of these questions that might be related to what we just talked about. A number of the concerns are about the reading level of the measure. So I would say for those of you that um, are working with younger youth or youth with lower reading abilities, practice the tip that Suzanne just did and read the survey aloud. I've done that in a number of settings with youth and 
you just have them follow along and you say, even if you know the words and you can skip ahead, just stay with the group and you administer it out loud in a large group. Kids are very used to this during the school day. So it's actually not as bad as you as an adult might think it is to listen to an entire survey. It also gives the opportunity for kids to ask questions if they don't understand some of the words or some of the concepts. This isn't a test, so you want to make sure that they understand what they're responding to. And then we'll potentially share this tip later, but if you're reading it out loud and you have kids with little bodies that aren't able to sit through a full administration, then break it up. Do resilience one time, do program quality another, or you know, however you want to split the measure, chunk it into small pieces. And as always, food as an incentive. That's how we get our kids through it. Our program leads are very clear that this is important. They can do it. We want to hear youth voice. And then we give them food after they do the survey. So um, <laughs> whatever works to incentivize kids to move through. Did you see any other questions there, Suzanne, that we didn't hit? I don't think so. So I, and we'll, we'll go back to this later and make sure we didn't miss anything. Maybe we can unmute some people. Um, so, all right. So we just talked a little bit about which measures we use, how you administer them, but then what, right? Because we're not done yet. So uh, about a year ago, almost a year ago, um, Survey Builder 3.0 went live. And so grants can again um, create a survey in Cypher Suites, uh, upload the data, uh, use Survey Builder to administer the surveys um, and uh, look at their data. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, reminder of Survey Builder. Um, once you have created a survey, you have the print button, um, which will give you, if you want to use the, the measures on paper and pencil, you can print uh, the PDFs. So you don't have to scour Cypher Suites for the PDFs and, and hope that you got all of them. If you have um, created your survey, you have selected your age group, um, and so Cypher Suites will automatically give you the measures that are required for your, for your age group. Um, so obviously pre will give you the pre-surveys, post will give you the post-surveys, and then we also have them available in Spanish. Um, once you have um, collected your data, um, you can upload this um, in, uh, survey, in Survey Builder. Um, uh, on the next slide, I'll give you a tip. Um, but you have participant entered pre and post data and then staff entered and the staff entered will always be there, even if you are working with adults and so staff is not tracking any data for your participants. Um, but that was easier to build. Um, if you are working with adults, the code book and templates will just be empty for those because we're not expecting staff to track anything for adults. Um, with um, Survey Builder, you can um, you can use Survey Builder to administer the surveys online, which is by clicking pre-survey and post-survey. The button there that says staff survey is is program quality from the staff's perspective. Um, so, um, but if you use uh, Survey Builder to administer, you do not actually have to upload your data into Survey Builder because it will automatically be there. So a tip is that when you are starting to think about data collection is to create that survey right away, even though you might be a month or two or a week or some time away from actually uploading data. Um, because when you do and you click um, that upload participant pre or post data button, you come to this screen which gives you a download pre data template or post data template, depending on which button you click. Um, template files. It'll give you a template which with all the headers, um, the way they are supposed to be for Survey Builder to accept your data um, and your code book so that if you are using pencil and paper, you know which numerical value goes with what answer. Um, so if you have this beforehand, you can set up your data collection uh, in a way that creates the least amount of work afterwards. 
Um, so this is what you would see if you click um, the survey for the online version. Um, you get a screen where the participants can start the survey or you have that nice button that says view QR code. And if a student scans this code with a tablet, they come to the survey and can um, collect it, can, can complete it um, on their device. If you do not want to use Survey Builder, because there are some downsides to it, um, you can, for example, not start and uh, restart. Um, you uh, cannot uh, use it on offline. Um, you can also use Qualtrics. This is a tool where you can set it up so that a, a participant can stop after the resilience measure and then the next week continue on to the next measure. Um, it also has an offline function. Um, so. Uh, Qualtrics is a powerful tool. Uh, you do not have to build the survey yourself. We can share with you. Um, so um, if you would like to use Qualtrics and you have uh, not started that process yet, reach out to us and we can share with you. Um, and then uh, stay tuned for a Qualtrics download tip to make your life easier before the upload. Once you do upload, um, if you are um, unsuccessful, these red boxes will pop up. And that means that Survey Builder found an error in your data. Um, the most common ones are wrong headers. So that's why I recommend you get that template um, right away um, so that you can use the headers from the template. Um, empty cells not coded as 99 is another um, often seen error. Um, the unique ID and the survey language columns are switched. Um, often, you know, kids are very excited that they are not just three, but almost four. And so they will say, I'm three and a half. Um, and Survey Builder will only take cool numbers. So if they are, if they turn three yesterday or they turn four tomorrow, and today they are three. And so three is the correct answer. Um, it will not take those half numbers that kids try to put in. Um, and then sometimes, especially with adding, uh, with entering um, data from paper and pencil administrations is accidentally typing a six when you typed a, when you needed a five. Um, so it's a value out of range. Um, the nice thing about Survey Builder is that it will tell you exactly what cell is wrong. Um, so if you have that three and a half and you have 300 participants, you do not have to try and find that three and a half because the error message will say in this cell, um, it, it is the, the wrong number. All right, let's take a quick minute. There are a couple questions that were more related to surveys and Survey Builder. Is there a plan to make a QR code for the staff survey? I don't know that answer. So Suzanne, is there a QR code being developed for the staff survey? Because we do have that on the youth survey end. Yes, and we have it on the list. Um, it is uh, at this point not prioritized high enough for our web team to work on it. Um, but it is on the list of suggestions uh, to create that because uh, right now, I think most programs are having the staff completed on paper and one person goes in and enters it and then goes in again and enters the next one. And we recognize that that is a cumbersome process. So yes, that is on our list of suggestions. Another tip, and Suzanne, you could tell me this is totally wrong, is you use the survey link for your staff and then use some kind of link shortener. That's what we will do at, in Minnesota. So we create, they're called Z-links. And so I can make a shortened link, not a QR code, but at least a short link for staff to just copy and paste as they're going through to update that information. So not the solution you're looking for, sorry, but I think there's ways to make it easier for people to put data in. All right, is that? I think that may be it on questions. Keep them coming in if you have them about surveys and Survey Builder. So, building the survey in Survey Builder or using it in Qualtrics is one piece, and we can help you if you have any questions. So, please, you know, put those questions in or follow up with us after the webinar. 
The next challenge is thinking about how you get the data from your program participants. And I would say this is where the real work comes in. While Survey Builder might feel overwhelming, um, getting the data is where the real work is. And that's also where many of you have the most experience. So personally, I can vouch as a former evaluator on a grant that getting the right data took quite a bit of forethought from me. And a couple of tips that worked really well for implementation that I'll share. And I'd love to, we're gonna give you a place to share your tips as well is to create, Suzanne, if you want to flip to the next page, to create communication with staff to make sure that everyone is on the same page. I create a survey cheat sheet, a guide, whatever it's called. Um, and this guide allows me to have all the information about the surveys that we're conducting and give that out to staff, both the PI, and anyone else working directly with youth. So they know where's the link for tracking attendance, where's the link for the pre-survey, where's the link for the poster survey. They don't get the post-survey link until it's post-survey time. I don't have to worry about them grabbing the wrong link and completing the wrong survey in the wrong place. So for me, having one grounding document with kind of directions to walk through the evaluation process was really helpful. As an evaluator, I found that showing up to the programs and offering to help is something that sites, my sites love. So showing up with an iPad when we, we originally collected all of our data through iPads, now we're doing it mostly just through survey links and not through iPads, but I could show up to the site with the iPad and carry the iPad around the room. So I made sure that all the youth took the survey and I could answer any questions that they had. We also found in Minnesota that assigning a program staff to run pieces of the evaluation, meaning like getting youth, making sure they were tracking who's done pre and post, was a great job for an intern or a short-term short staff who was already supporting our program. So they were already in the spaces, they already had relationships built with kids, and then that was one of their tasks is to track pre and post completion and to update our attendance log that we had for our program. So think about who on your site is the right person to engage in some of those steps. But communication is key in order to make sure that all people are moving in the right direction. I want to make sure you're no. Yeah, I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. And why did so Jill wants to know why did we shift away from using iPads? The biggest reason was yeah. because of the pandemic. So we weren't in space to face to face, and we started to in Zoom take a pause in our when we were meeting mostly in Zoom. We would take a pause in our program section session and say, follow the survey link and complete your post survey. And that seemed to work well. And now youth in the program are kind of used to that. So we haven't gone back to using iPads at the same level because the web links work really well. And our site is working with a little bit older kids. So they have phones and devices that they are very competent to use to take evaluations on. Um, I see a question about reducing or addressing the survey straight lining um, and the, the, it's a good question. And I would recommend if that really is happening is breaking it up in multiple sessions um, so that they don't have to go through 93 questions in one day. Um, I don't know Another thing other. out, yeah, is doing, when you read things out loud and then you wander around the room, if you're in space together, you can notice when kids aren't paying attention and they're just filling out too. So that's where I will, you know, get down and say, hey, are you thinking about your answers before you're checking the box? And then it's usually like, no, <laughs> and then they start taking it seriously. So there's something nice about that read aloud option as well to make sure that kids are paying attention to the item. 
no surveys are perfect though, unfortunately. So do the best you can. We recognize that all surveys, all projects have survey errors and that's part of our calculations as well. So I mentioned when we talked about Qualtrics that we have a um, Qualtrics trick um, and that is to make your Qualtrics download work for you and specifically to work for the survey builder upload. So um, AD4 is the adult demographic question. So this is select all that apply to you. Um, so participants can have, mul they can select multiple races. Um, if you just download your um, survey from Qualtrics without doing anything special, this is how it will come out. But Survey Builder needs it like this spread out into multiple columns with zero for they did not select this option and one for they did select this option. As you can see, that first row has a one in two and a one in five, the rest are zeros. Um, and then the other three, they have a one in two. So the, the AD41 through AD45 is the way that Survey Builder can accept the upload. And you can actually, make that happen in Qualtrics so that you do not have to manually split out these values. Um, so when you are downloading, um, another tip I will give is to always click that um, use numeric value um, box because otherwise you'll get your data with strongly agree, uh, disagree, which of course you would have to recode that into numerical value. So check, check the use numeric values box um, but then click more options. And then there, the second to last option is spl split multi-value fields into columns. And if you click this and then hit download, it will split out that one column into the five so that you do not have to manually do this before you upload your data to Survey Builder. That was the tip that changed my life. So I'm really excited to work with our data now that I know that because it is, um, it doesn't default to it if you're using Qualtrics and our team does use Qualtrics for their data management. All right, so now we know that you all have tips and tricks that you've used when either with common measures collecting data, or if you're new to common measures, you've probably done survey efforts with youth in, in other programs. So we are gonna share a link to a Jamboard. I'm gonna put the link in the chat, and then Suzanne, you can um, hop, stop share to that as well, okay. and we can pull it up. So the Jamboard is a way for us to share some of our ideas. And if you all haven't used it, you click on that link and it should bring up a Jamboard. And Suzanne, if you wanna share that, yep. I can see what I'm navigating. I'm gonna explain. So if you already know Jamboard, we're, we're asking you to write your challenges and successes. So if you look on the left-hand toolbar, the fourth icon down is a little, I think it's that one, right? Is a sticky note. And so there you would write your idea. What are your challenges or your successes in doing evaluation of common measures? Write your idea and then push save. And it makes a little sticky note that we all can have access to to share our tips and tricks that make surveying easier with youth. So we're going to give you a couple minutes here. Please check it out and um, add a sticky note or two. Can someone confirm that um, here? That should be the link in the chat. And if you're unable to use the Jamboard and you wanna put your idea in the chat, Suzanne and I can copy your ideas over into the Jamboard. I see many people joining now. Okay, good. An octopus, a bat, a camel. <laughs> I like it that Google makes these animals. We wanted to give you an opportunity to share. Oh.
All right, we're generating some ideas. I think we could probably content analyze, analyze them. And survey length is always going to be on there. <laughs> Suzanne, do you want to speak anything to survey length? I'm new to this, so I, I can't justify. <laughs> yeah, um, we know that it's long. Um, I, we've known from the start, um, but the uh, we feel the advantage of having every program use the same common measures outweighs the length, especially with the uh, Fact, mitigating factors you can use like breaking it up into multiple sessions so that they are not I saw somewhere uh oh yeah not it is boring well yes if you uh, or time spent away from activities we like to do if one session turns into an evaluation session totally understandable so breaking it up into two or three um sessions um can help with that and it will give us really good data I think some of the successes to highlight on there is are about communicating with youth to say that it's important that your voices are heard, their involvement matters, that we're not asking you to do this, even if you think it's boring, we're not asking you to do it for the fun of it. We are using this information. Um, those of you who are in hot climates, Minnesota doesn't have this problem, I feel like ever, but you could use it as an indoor break. I love that <laughs> for hot outdoor programs. I see a note on here of finding ways to use the Cypher questions to be part of your impact story. We have a number of sessions on that at PDE this year. So I hope that some of you or some people from your grant will be joining us in Chicago at the beginning of June. And we will likely bring some of those sessions. I'm not gonna promise because Philip and Suzanne are in charge of that. But if there's interest, we can probably run some sessions on that topic as well for future webinar topics. I can say there's a question on here, is retrospective pre-post an option? Right now, it's not the way the questions are designed. So no, it's not an option right now. I hear the one time between pre and post is difficult to keep consistent. That is very true and hard to, to time perfectly. I would say as the years go on in your grant, you get better at finding the rhythm that makes sense. So hopefully green post it, you are a newer funded program and have we'll learn something that you can apply in the next year. Suzanne, anything you see on? Well, I see a question that says, how long should we wait maximally between the post surveys and the end of the last session of the program? And so I would say that is zero, like in your last session, you could do the post evaluation. You do not have to hope that you can catch your participants after your program has ended. Um, I, the, I saw the kids don't have writing utensils with them, like come in very early as a challenge. And that is a challenge that I had not thought of. <laughs> um, and that is a very practical challenge. Um, and so I wonder if having uh, a box of pencils available um, is an option there. Um, but that is very practical um, and will prevent your participants from completing a survey if you were doing it on paper. Exactly. So yes. This is great. Well, let's flip back to our slides. It's 
We wanted to archive some of your challenges and successes as also a form of evaluation so we can, some of these things we knew about and some were new to us. So we can use that as we're training in new grantees and working with all of you to help to find as many solutions to some of the problems that we face. Are there any tips, Suzanne, that we want to share that didn't come up in their successes or challenges? Uh, I think we have mentioned all of them. I, you know, when we were preparing, we kept talking about know your audience. And I think that's, that's one of the most important things, um, especially because you are all working with vulnerable populations. Um, so um, we, we recommend that you try your hardest to collect the data from your participants while we know that that might be a challenge. Um, we yeah, did, know your audience and plan ahead maybe is yes. the other one because yeah. especially those of you with um, short staffing or frequent programs, you have to really plan to make sure that you get the right information. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I cut you off. What else? No, you... that's so. Okay, that's okay. The one thing we didn't really talk about is IRB. Um, you you do need to do IRB at your own institution before you start collecting data, um, and so um, as as you are a new, if you are a new grant in in the first year, then now is the time to start working on your IRB proposal. Um, but many of you might already be past that stage because you're already in year two or three or four or five. Um, but that's an important part of this process as well that we hadn't touched upon yet. All right, so thank you everyone for joining with us. We will stay around for a couple more minutes to answer any questions, but we also wanted to make sure you knew where to find us. We know that we have a follow-up with SHAR to make sure that you are not downloading 193 pages of surveys. We'll help you through that. Um, but there's our email address, Twitter address, and website if you need or want some more information. Suzanne, anything else? No, um, if there are questions, um, send them our way and we will try our best to help answer them. I also think we probably have time for about maybe one or two questions. So if you have a question and you have it, uh, you can either place it in the Q&A or you can uh, put it in the chat. Or if you want, you can raise your hand and I can give you speaking permission so you can ask the question live. Um, but while that's going on, one of the things I wanted to uh, bring up, kind of going back to the language. Uh, so I know as some of the things that our coaches have done has is uh, talk to the different grantees about understanding that if you have to translate something, it is OK to translate it into a language that somebody understands. And that doesn't just mean translating from like English to uh, to uh, Arabic or English to Spanish, but then also translating as far as, as we talked about earlier, sometimes it might be at a grade level that's too high for somebody using different words, as long as you're getting the meaning out. Um, what are your guys, what, what are your all thoughts on that? While you think about that, let me answer Jill's question. Uh, no, the sessions in Chicago will not be recorded or shared on the and thus not shared on the website because there is nothing to share. Uh, that's not true. The presentations that um, presenters will use, they will be on the website, but no recording of it. That was the advantage of being virtually the last two years, um, the ability to record and post afterwards. And really that question was for uh, you to- uh, Oh. 
I agree. Um, this isn't a test. So we want to make sure that you understand the concepts, that they understand the questions. So speak in terms that make sense. And I would say let kids go through and ask the questions that they need. Don't feel like you have to narrate the survey experience because that gets to be really frustrating for a young person to, you know, listen to you telling them this word means this, wait and ask them or wait for them to need help. I'll also add on, Philip, you brought to mind a tip that we didn't share, and that is your coach is one of your best resources as you're thinking about evaluation and want support implementing evaluation. Know that that is a resource to help talk through any issues or problems. Of course, us, but your coach knows you, they know your site, and they are a great support for you. So we have another question that says, I understand the common measure tools or the standard set of questions in occasions, if we think one or two, um, two items do not relate to what we're doing in the project or the program, or we see kids consistently uh, missing to respond, should we consider removing them? So the answer is no, because for those measures that are validated, they are validated with all the questions that are on it. And for the others, we are trying to validate them with the questions that are on it. If your kids miss some questions, you do not have to go back to them and ask them to do those questions as well. Um, as Sam mentioned earlier, that's built into our process that we know that there is item non-response. Um, and so, but we do need to offer all participants all questions. Um, we cannot require all participants to answer all questions. And so just checking to see if we have any other questions. Or if there's any questions that we missed earlier that were in the chat. If not, I want to take a quick moment to uh, once again, remind everybody that the Cypher Professional Development event uh, will be in Chicago. So if you have not registered, please register. Um, the registration and the room block, uh, well, the room block has closed, but you can still reach out to the, to the hotel to see if they have rooms available. Um, registration is now in the late registration uh, uh, realm, but again, please do register. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about the PDE, you can check it out on the sci-fi.org website, or you can reach out to your coach or any one of us that are on the call. And again, if there are no other questions, uh, we want to just say thank you to you all for joining and participating in this webinar. We hope that you all received uh, some, some valuable tips and some good information. Uh, if there are still outstanding questions, please reach out to either Suzanne, uh, Sam, or myself, or any one of your coaches. Uh, we are here to help support you. And then also, I think it's very important to uh, remember that the CIFAR common measures are just another tool that we try to use to help NIFA fight for CIFAR dollars. So they're not going to be perfect for your specific program because it wasn't designed specifically for your program. So keep that in mind as you're going through and just uh, do your best to help support. Because again, it's, it, the goal is to try to help make sure that we have money for CIFAR programs in general. Again, thank you all. And we will see you all next time. Um, but more importantly, we will see you all in Chicago.